Hi there, my name is David Yun, and I've built this podcast for all of us photographers looking for some extra inspiration. Every Friday, I interview local photographers about the how and the why behind their projects, and at the end of each episode, I add a thought or a challenge for both of us to consider as we continue our pursuit of awesome photography. You can help me keep this project growing by sharing this podcast with your photo-loving friends and by subscribing and leaving a review or a rating on your podcast platform of choice. Ultimately, the goal is to stir up conversation and thoughtfulness about photography as a practice, and I wanted to start each episode with a thank you. Your attention and focus on these artists and these conversations help the community at large keep growing. So... Without further ado, welcome to my viewfinder. Do you have a favorite sound? Okay, so three immediately come to mind. And one I don't get to hear anymore, but it's just always been my favorite sound. And that is when my kids were little, the sound of their breathing when they were sleeping. Just one of the most loveliest things that, uh, yeah. And I would have to say rain is still like a favorite sound. And just, just being in nature and hearing, just getting somewhere where you don't hear traffic and just just hear the sounds of nature, whatever that, whatever that may present as. It's just a, a birds, maybe it's the wind. Mount, mountains and forests over Broadway, I guess. Uh, I'm trying to think. I like peacefulness of nature, but yeah, city kid. I also like being in the middle of a city, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did too, but I wouldn't say it was my, you know, the peaceful favorite noises. Yeah, well, you know, I guess you can make an argument that, you know, being in your favorite restaurant is a very nice noise. <laughs> well, and yeah. you have all the background noise and the, yeah, the chatter. And... Yeah, when I was uh, young and I used to ride the subway more, just being on the subway is an interesting thing. Although, yeah, in the 90s, they had no air conditioning, so it depends on the day that you're in there. Cause... And you gross. know, you bring up a good point. Maybe it's maybe it's what you're exposed to as a child. So, I mean, when I grew up, I was in nature. I was working with an animal in the middle of nowhere. And honestly, when I go back to my father's, with, I mean, the, the farm is in the middle of nowhere. The, the, the sound of silence is heavy. Like, it, it, it actually feels pressurized. It's so quiet because you're so not used to hearing it anymore. So... Maybe that's it. Maybe the, the city sounds are comforting and your favorite sounds because that's what you relate to from childhood. Maybe there's some connection. My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supportive. The Alberta Podcast Network is a program to support Albertan podcasts by connecting us with local businesses and initiatives to keep our stories and our interests at the fore. If you're interested in finding more Albertan podcast content in a wide range of topics, check out their website, albertapodcastnetwork.com, or you can connect with them over social media. They are at albertapodnet on both Instagram and Twitter. Our first sponsor this week is ATB. Hosted by Todd Hirsch, ATB Financial's Vice President and Chief Economist, The Future Of Podcast has launched its second season by connecting with industry leaders to uncover what's on the horizon for the things that mean the most to you, the Future Of podcast promises to give you insights to help navigate what is often an uncertain future. Explore how our economy and communities can not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. Subscribe to the Future Of in the Apple Store, Google Play, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts are found, and connect with us at atb.com slash the future of. What is the line between working with a subject or taking advantage of one? How do we know if we're building images that show our subjects in their best light? There's of course no one single answer, but Angela shares her insight that she's gained through her work and her participation with the ICP in New York. Uh, she also talks about what urban parks are like in the ironically named Big Apple. Here's the conclusion of my talk with Angela Bain. This actually goes to the other question that I was going to ask you about how the camera figures into these relationships. So I often say that once I have the camera in hand, I'm no longer in that moment. So if I'm out 
on a walk with my wife and my son and I have my camera, I am not a father or a husband. I am a photographer. For me, and, and this is not like this is a law, but for me, I have trouble separating myself to fully engage, let's say, with playing with my son and running around or thinking that he's got a place so I can take a picture of it. Um, you know, walking with my wife and then getting distracted because I think I need to take a picture of something that's happening outside of our conversation. The camera is such a weird, I mean, it's like any tool. We get into this weird relationship uh, as an artist uh, with our subjects through this medium. I, I mean, this thought came up when you're talking about your father. You know, you brought up that it was a great way for you to break this barrier that he would open up because the camera's involved. Um, and I often posit the opposite. So, um, I mean, how do you feel about yeah how this tool is being used in general? Do you think that it's, I mean, it sounds actually like it's helping you to connect with human beings rather than the opposite. Oh, it's been a complete gift, right? Like the, the amount of time that I got to spend with my kids and get to know their friends because I was with them taking pictures and the relationships that I built with them is probably the greatest gift I'll ever get from my camera. It really is. And same with my father, you know, and like I have a, a wonderful, there's there's certain pictures that I've chosen to put in my essay, but of course there's highly personal ones too that I won't probably ever share. But again, what a great, what a great gift to have, you know, gone and done all this exploring together. And and the only reason really, really did this was to take pictures so I could take pictures. I guess it kind of provided an excuse, if you like, to to kind of do things like that. But yeah, it's just it's just an excuse to explore and be curious. And um, I was thinking while you were talking about how to take pictures while you're with your kid, and the way you described it, I felt like saying I couldn't in that situation, I couldn't meditate and play with my kid at the same time. Right. It's sort of like, how do you do those two things at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I'm more extreme, so I just don't bring my camera out. But that's not a working solution either, in one sense. Um, I, the other I thing... I have an idea. What's that? So rather than taking pictures of your kid, your child, take pictures with them. And then just say, what should we take pictures of today? And how are we going to do this? And then just start doing it as a like teamwork as opposed to separate work. <laughs> we, we have had fun uh, sessions where... Uh, he'll get his turn to take pictures of me, but, uh, and they're great. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, if you get pictures from like a four-year-old carrying a camera, they're fantastic. I, uh, yeah, I, I think they're great. Just, they see, they literally see the world from a completely yeah. different uh, space. But yeah, I, I think that's, it's just giving me a lot to think about. I, I struggle with this idea of connecting with people for the reasons that actually seem to drive you to do so. So maybe I'm inherently selfish, but this idea that I can propose to be a part of somebody's storytelling has not been a natural thing for me. Um, but it is fascinating to hear that that might be how you got into photography in the first place. I mean, I don't, I can't presume the first thought you had when you uh, were thinking about your kids, but there, it seems like there's a yeah, a strong documentarian aspect to it. I mean, maybe from that, I mean, let's talk about uh, your current work because you can't see other human beings. Um, how do we get to the trees then? No, I honestly, if you would have told me three, two, three years ago, I'd be taking pictures of landscapes. I would have just gone, you know, it's just no way. I'm never going to take a landscape picture. But, you know, when you have nothing, and, and I'm not saying anything against landscape, it's just never, I mean, there's nobody to talk to there. There's, <laughs> you know, like the, nobody talks back. But when I started it, I mean, there's a real, there's some beautiful ways that light falls in a forest. And and I started to see, so like when I when I took pictures, well, of, of everything I've done, I've always, I've tried to use lights and lighting, but as an example with my father, I just, and I can always see it in, in photo essays when somebody's using light, even if they use it beautifully, because you'll get a very nice, beautiful picture of somebody if you use artificial light. But people live in their house according to where the light comes in. And I, I, I think you have to be sort of sensitive to that because otherwise you're manipulating and it doesn't make sense. 
And so I've always really paid attention to where light comes in to the house or pictures or wherever it is I am and, and how people are walking around or doing or living with that light. And so I started going into the forest. I started realizing, well, it's very much the same way in here. The light comes into a forest to say a certain way. And how do I come to this? Well, I, I, I hear, you know, when I talk to people a lot, particularly on Zoom, and a lot of people I, I went to school with that live in, in the middle of New York, and they've never, I mean, to them, the forest is it's a very different concept, the forest. Actually, I, I have, if we have time, I'll tell you a story about a park essay I did there. But uh, all this doom and gloom about, you know, our forests are dying and climate change and da da da. And not that there's no reason to be concerned. And, you know, yes, this is a problem we have to figure out. But every time I looked at the forest, we I, I go to um, BC a lot in the summer. And every time I go down certain highways, it's like a, a timeline of fires. And all I see, I don't see the doom and gloom. I see the hope and the regeneration of the forest after fire. And I thought, you know, I, I kind of got to show this to them because it's, you know, it's it's not all doom and gloom. What I'm what I'm seeing is hope. And so I started to just go in and experiment with with taking some photos in there. And the more we did it, the more I realized like it's really peaceful in the forest. <laughs> Very quiet. It's it's sort of the uh, there's this whole movement now of you know, I think it's called nature bathing. Somebody just yeah, I, somebody just brought this up to me last week and I've researched it and it's it's how you should get back into nature to restore your soul and all these kinds of things, which I kind of really believe because it, it is very refreshing to be in nature and just all you hear is no cars, but just, you know, some leaves fluttering and some birds or whatever it is that presents itself that day. And so I, I think the impetus was was many fold. I, I can't photograph people. I'm driving by, I think, what is this amazing story of regeneration and, and the story of the resilience of nature and, and how, you know, nature's going to come back just fine if we let it. So that's where I started with that. Still going at it. I'm going to continue. I like that there's a mention about also giving hope to other human beings that, you know, there's just, you're, you're involved with people, even when you're shooting nature. I, there's a lot of people that shoot nature and landscapes that just want geometry, light to sell a print, water, animals. But you started your story off by wanting to give hope to New Yorkers who uh, thought the world was gonna end. <laughs> I have to tell this story because I was, I was doing a class at ICP and they said, okay, what you're gonna do is you're going to go, I can't remember the name of this park, and you're gonna take, you're gonna do a story. What we want you to do is walk around first and take notes and then come back and we can talk about the notes and you go back and shoot it. So I went in and I thought, okay, I'm gonna to go to a park now. And I walked across the street and I walked into this area they said this was, and I said, well, where's the park? <laughs> Cause of course, coming from Canada, I have this vision of what a park is, right? Nature, grass and everything. And certainly wasn't that. And I found out I was in the right place. So I walked around and I did this whole essay on how unbelievable, like, why do you have a fence around a tree? Like, why, why is that? Just all the absurdity that I could see, like, just like artificial duck paint prints on the, on the, and actually, as I was photographing it, I had one of the security guards come and tell me to get off the grass. So it was just such a different experience, but yeah, they could use some hope when it comes to nature and things, so. Gentrification, urbanization, evolution of human existence. It's fun. Fun to think about stuff like that. I, uh, I'm just I'm just imagining duck prints. This one, I, I think Toronto's a little bit different because it's still quite green, but when you're in urban dense areas, there's uh, like I remember coming out here and, and learning what why they call it big sky country. I cannot remember being in Toronto looking at the sky. That's a weird thing to say because the sky exists, um, but there's a feeling when I grew up there that you had to be looking at the ground, maybe for safety or stress, <laughs> or I don't know what it is. Uh, now, when I go back, it's even more intimidating. I mean, I, now I'm used to looking up and maybe this becomes a metaphor of what we're talking about. Um, you know, just this training to seeing people as people wanting to uh, show them in their best light. So I definitely go back to Toronto and look at things as a photographer now, but so I'm, uh, like I'll walk on Bloor Street and I, I can look up, I can see a sunset. I mean, it's now, tucked away behind thousands and thousands of condos but but it is there 
But I do definitely remember distinctly coming here because um, I saw just broad open sky, such a prairie thing. I got to be on a mountain, which is such a great sense of scale, which you don't get in Toronto. And, um, and as a Toronto kid, if I visited New York, it's like, you know, it's exponential. I mean, I don't know what it's like for someone who grew up, you know, in a small town or in the prairies to go visit New York. Um, but, uh, you know, when I go to very big metropolises, it's, it's quite overwhelming because, um, yeah, it's just a fundamentally different energy and you have to kind of be in a pocket. Maybe the metaphor is you are a, a fenced off tree. I don't know. It's, there's something, there's something different about it, you know, absurd. But you know. I think it, it, I think it's interesting that when you came to Alberta, you, you felt it was big sky country. Cause I, when I take my kids, I remember like even as teenagers and we go to see my dad in Saskatchewan and, and my kids grew up in Calgary, they would say, wow, the sky is so big here. <laughs> compared to here because i mean the land is so flat but uh yeah you know that's probably another reason why i also picked up my camera here just opening your eyes it's such a weird thing now that i'm listening to you i'm thinking you know i got to get off this pedestal where i'm just going to refuse to uh engage with humans <laughs> you mean yeah. from COVID? no uh, with my camera i um I've been struggling a lot, to be honest with you, about what I'm supposed to take pictures of. Well, don't pre-think it. So when you talk about going uh, anywhere you've been and having this intuition to take photographs of people, there's already a narrative building piece in your mind, which I think is beautiful because it informs the work. It's, um, it's giving it a shape that you can rely on and, and ask that next question. Is there something that you've learned about how people act that you key into really quickly or do you just find you know some people you just in instinctively know that i've got to be a bit pushy and some people you know that oh there's there's some unknown cue that i'm going to come back in three weeks <laughs> well i i think that's that's what i mean by their music everybody has their own comfort level and you can kind of is there's this sort of gray area everybody has around them you know, if you think of the bubble and there's the gray area outside of the bubble <laughs> And you kind of figure out how, how far you can go into that gray area. And it's, it's a bit of a dance, maybe. And I, I, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's funny. I, I, I did a, um, a workshop and I was getting access quite quickly. And every day we'd be putting up our photographs. And, and I had a couple of people come and ask me to go for lunch with them. And then they wanted me to show them how I was getting access. And so I said, OK, well, let's go and photograph that guy over there He's sitting at a table. And so this guy gets up and he runs over there and he says, okay, and we walk over together and immediately I could, he gets too close and he, he's right, right then and there going to say, can I take your photograph? And I, I kind of held him back and I just said, look at his watch. And then I said to the fellow, I really like your watch. That's a nice watch. Do you mind if I take a picture of your watch? So it's not immediately his face. Because I, I do a lot of, that's how I would manage street photography as well, which is something I enjoy doing. It's not immediately a space. It's, you know, a slow progression on making somebody comfortable with you. And you're talking about something that's personal to them, but not too personal. And then, and, and, and it's just a way of warming up to them. It's not trying to take advantage of a situation. It's, it's like, I, I actually want to get to know you and, and I want whatever I capture of you to represent and as long as you're okay with it and i want i hope you feel okay with it and if you don't that's fine too but i i i can honestly say i don't think i've ever been turned down for a picture except for myself <laughs> <laughs> a self portrait yeah we could go on about self portrait when i talked to caitlin about that and she kind of challenged me i i still haven't taken a, a post self portrait it's just yeah, there's psych there's psychology there for sure, but um, it is you know it's interesting you know I, again I I apologize I think I might have missed it on the uh, recording but you know you um, grow up you work in a, a corporate environment at CP and then you do philanthropy and what I'm hearing from you and how you approach it and this is why there's a big ethical discussion about street photography in particular but I think in all genres of photography this. Uh, concept of showing your subject in their best light you sound you know very humanist there's something where you are approaching other people and wanting to be yeah at a at a very what's the right word 
yeah, human level. You, you, it sounds like if, if I wanted to, I mean, I, I wouldn't approach somebody in a restaurant to take a picture of them in the first place, but uh, to key in, for example, to look at something that you think either they or you are interested in outside of, you know, uh, the verbs like capturing, shooting, stealing, um, owning, you know, this power dynamic. It is fascinating. Even when I see pictures of salary men, they're not uh, posed in such a way to be uh, overly politicized or aggressive or or um, or bent. They're uh, photographs of people in these moments that seem very personal, even, you know, in a restaurant or whatever. In, I don't know if they're technical restaurants, but in an eatery. It is fascinating to think about that. I, I, I struggle with street photography now um, because I don't know if I think about people that way. <laughs> um, I don't wish anybody ill, but I often question whether photographs I take serve their best interests, whatever I imagine them to be. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating to hear you say that. You know, just talk about their watch. Be, notice the space around them. It's not something that most people are aware of in my experience. Uh, yeah, my experience, people don't actually deal with each other very well. <laughs> Uh, I, I I don't know how to, like, I can only speak for, like, I, I, I wouldn't think that that was unusual. And, you know, it's interesting, like, I, I have never, like, all, any of, like, you mentioned the poses in, in Salary Man, I never posed any of those at all. Not one. Yeah, they're all just somebody acting the way they want to act. And there was the other things that they would show me in their rooms, like pictures. And I remember one, uh, there is this sort of pop girls, pop music girls, and salary men can get very lonely over time. And so what they tend to do is, is watch these pop music girls and they get their favorite girl. And then they, they have memorabilia and stuff, and, but that's very private. And he actually pulled it out and showed it to me. And I, was t I didn't know what it was. I was taking pictures of it. And my fixer later said, I can't believe he showed you that. That is so personal that it, it's just crazy that he showed it to you. I would never show those pictures to anybody. Like those are just something that he may one day feel like he went, he showed me too much and he doesn't want that out in the world. And, but, um, my mind's thinking about how, you know, we're now talking essentially about ethics and whether, you know, these are things that are supposed to be uh, constructed and enforced by society, or in your case, it seems intuitive. I mean, the idea that once you realize somebody has both a personal and private relationship with something, be it an action or an object, that you feel that's not your place to expose that to the public, that is often what a lot of these uh, debates are about. You know, if I am on the street and I see a picture of a couple fighting or somebody that left the, a child unattended for a moment, uh, is it a documentarian right that we expose people and have this gotcha culture? Or is there a moment that, you know, maybe it, it comments greater on society and maybe that can be shared? But when we overthink that, uh, that's such a murky place to live in because... Uh, yeah, I think I think that the line is... So I, I took a class in ethics. Uh, I think for me, the line is the gotcha moment. It, I mean, if you're, if you're saying the word gotcha, you probably shouldn't be taking the picture, right? Is it going to be useful in, in the future in terms of helping that person? One of the examples was domestic violence. And a photographer was in uh, taking pictures of this family and it ended up being a, a situation of domestic violence. And while when it started flaring, she continued to take pictures while somebody else was calling the police. And he ended up in jail because of those pictures. Um, so was it right to take those pictures or should it, the camera have been turned off? You know, it, it's, it becomes, um, uh, and and I, I hope I never find myself in that situation. I don't want to ever make that decision, but that you can see an argument. So it's, there's, I think there's a delineation between the gotcha moment and the helpful moment. And they can both be really bad situations. The commonality would be a bad situation, perhaps. And, and, how, you, and how you share it and expose it. And there could be all kinds of reasons that, that that's wrong. <laughs> That, you know, on the spur of the moment, I may not be thinking of, but um, that's just a, a memory that sticks with me from that class. Yeah, I'm really glad to have met you. Angela. Yeah, that was great to talk. <laughs> and you know what? If you ever want to go out and photograph, 
Like if you feel like you're in a rut and you just want to go out and take some pictures and I'd be happy to go out sometime. Yeah, I keep telling everybody I've been interviewing that, I mean, we're playing a little close to the chest with this whole pandemic thing, but I made the mistake uh, of assuming when I got into Exposure Studio that I knew so many people in the city that were already photographers. And then we log in, I'm like, I have no idea who any of these people are, like I could name <laughs> four. And then of course, uh, when I look at everybody's work, um, yeah, we have, I, I had a small magazine that I made because I wanted people to realize what creative potential we hide in this city because Calgary has this connotation of, you know, beef and oil, but there are amazing artists that live here and we just, we, I don't know, we don't have a big enough voice or it's just getting to the point where we're getting out there and people need to know like how many great photographers we have, creators, painters, poets. Uh, I've met some incredible people over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it, 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 I think Calgary is a bit different in the sense that there's no venues for photography here. Like it doesn't promote photography. It doesn't embrace it as an art form so much as other places. So it, that poses a problem for any emerging photographer because usually you have to emerge in your own community and then branch out from there. So it's very difficult, I think, to even emerge here unless you create something yourself, so. It's a weird thing too, because I think I read somewhere that out of Canada anyways, we have the highest camera sales. I mean, we have so much nature and mountains and everybody seems to carry like a $6,000, you know, Canon telephoto lens. But but like you said, yeah, we don't have dedicated anything. It's it's weird. Huh. We'll solve it. That's, that's our true task. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited about it. I just think um, once we can get over this part where we can't actually physically get together, we can come up with some great ideas. I'll just joke that as long as we don't get blood clots from whatever the solution is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be good. I don't want those. <laughs> no, yeah. I'd like the, the good vaccines. If you could tell the world one thing, what would it be? Oh, chill out. Don't take everything so seriously. Life's short. <laughs> Seriously. It's just not that important. How's that? It's just not that important. Oh, that's awesome. This episode is also brought to you by the Calgary Foundation, proudly supporting community needs for 65 years. Everyone wants to feel a sense of belonging. Now, more than ever, we are united by a desire to take action and help others by creating a community built on kindness and compassion. From small creative projects to larger citizen-led initiatives, the Calgary Foundation provides grassroots grants to encourage and support people who want to create and strengthen bonds between neighbors and communities. If you've got an idea to improve, enhance, or revitalize your community or neighborhood, visit calgaryfoundation.org to find out more about the Foundation's grant opportunities and visit the Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel. How do we know when we're taking pictures with our subjects? Where is the line between displaying work for the image itself and for a greater social conversation? This week, whether you're a documentarian or a fine art photographer or a hobbyist, perhaps we can spend a little time meditating on where we draw our own lines. Living with good conscience requires that we have a strong understanding of our values and of ourselves. It's a large ask for many of us. Uh, definitely for me. I've always struggled here despite my often noisy personality. How do we learn our limits and really define what we believe in? Only when that gets a bit clearer can we answer the bigger question of whether the work we produce is actually shining our subjects in their best light. Is there a best meal that you've had in your life? Oh, anything at Balthus or New York. Um... Oh God, if I could just get back there again one day, that'd be so nice, please. Um, oh, I'm a foodie, so that's a tough one. That's a real, so um, I th I'm going to say there was this dinner I went for, it, was in, it went to in Paris and it was my, uh, a friend of my husband's and this is for his 40th birthday party. A bunch of us went to to France and we went for dinner in Paris one night and this is something he had arranged, he'd done it all uh, and it was at this famous restaurant and I, I don't remember the flavors of the food, I just can't get over the 
minute details sculpture, like the, the mousse bouche had like it, it squid ink on top, foam, and it was just, it was crazy. So I would remember that one just because of the, the crazy off the charts, whatever you would call that uh, over the top presentation, but just simple food. Like it, when you travel and just the, simple comfort foods of, of other places are to me are always the best you know like the the lamb stew or the bean soup or the you know just the, the homey foods are always the most memorable i think that's what i like yeah nothing without squid ink <laughs> <laughs> squid ink's so weird although um, i just discovered uh vanilla scent it comes from a secretion out of a beaver and uh, you could google it but uh, yeah, I might after. <laughs> yeah, vanilla essence comes from a a sack in a 